welcome to the May 16th, 2022 policy committee meeting of the school district of Haverford Township. Let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I, um, I'll just start the committee meeting by saying we have an ambitious agenda for yeah. tonight. <laughs> there is a lot of content on here, um, and I think that is a reflection of this committee's goal of um, working through all of our policies on a schedule so that they can be reviewed. Um, this is an audit process that we've launched this year and um, are working out how to best work through these, and there's been a couple that um, have been returned to this committee and so are still on the agenda, which I think is an appropriate course of action, but we've left the um, like seven policies on tonight's <laughs> agenda with hopes that we might get to them, but I will say um, we do not have the intention of going beyond a two hour meeting. Okay. So <laughs> we will um, be mindful of the clock, see where we are and, and be able to cut things off um, if if we kind of get stuck in some of the, the policies that we discussed earlier. But um, with that, I will welcome Justin Barbetta from our solicitor's office, Whistler Perstein, to help us um, with the weighty task of these uh, policies tonight. Thank you, President Liedemann. Um, as you said, we have seven policies on the agenda this evening. The first um, policy that we're going to address is 006.1, um, which is actually a proposed policy. So it would be a new policy for the district um, as it pertains to um, electronic attendance at, at meetings. Um, when we were last here, I believe it was in March and discussing this proposed policy, uh, we presented the board with a, a copy of the PSBA model. Um, we There was some discussion and a request was made that we uh, re retain a copy of the DCIU model policy. So we have done that um, and circulated it to the committee for review. Just a, a few highlights, the, the major differences, and I think this was part of the discussion at the last committee meeting, um, really pertains to PSBAs having an, an unlimited amount of remote attendees um, and comparing that with the DCIU's version, which um, really emphasizes that a a majority or a quorum uh, be present in person um, when an, uh, someone is allowed to attend remotely. Um, the, the notice requirements are, are the same for both. It's three days prior notice um, before the meeting. Um, and then the I guess the other addition is that PSBA considers a hybrid scenario where some members are, are, are the, or actually, I'm sorry, where the meeting is um, the meeting is scheduled to be attended both in person and uh, through remote means. So those are, that's kind of an overview um, and it's really just a point for discussion and to see where we're at and, and if the committee chooses to move forward with a 006.1. Um, yeah, so thanks for the introduction there and the background on these. I think we've actually discussed this, I think this will be the third meeting that we're discussing this proposed policy at and um, I think some of the hesitancy was that there is um, a, a foreseeability of potential misuse of this type of policy. And certainly, I, mean, I don't think anyone on the current board would do this, but as we've seen, sometimes policies don't get reviewed mm -hmm. for 10 or 20 years. Um, one of the ones that we had on the meeting for tonight was from 1999. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think it is important to have these policies be something that we are confident in going forward. Um, no matter what the makeup of the board is. And I just, I guess I would want to get a feeling from the committee members what their um, inclination is to go towards, uh, to, to have this type of policy, whether it's something that we think that our board needs right now that we, um, we, have, we have a desire to recommend to the full board um, for, uh, to, to adopt this policy. Um, I, I could see a, a similar policy being enacted that doesn't have uh, participation just by specific board members on extraordinary circumstances, but potentially um, having a policy for 
if there's um, an extraordinary circumstance that would need a remote meeting of the entire board, um, we could have something like that instead of just specific board members. So I think a lot of the discussion has already happened on this one um, at previous meetings, but I'm, def um, I'm interested to see what our committee members um, uh, want going forward with this one if there is a desire to have this type of policy. I think for, for me, um, I'm probably more interested in this being available for the full board um, versus just one particular or select board members, only because we're saying this is for extenuating circumstances. And so if I'm in an emergency, during my emergency, am I gonna sign on to a board meeting? Mm -hmm. And that just seems like we're placing um, a greater responsibility on a board member doing what I presume to be a personal emergency situation. Um, my other thing, which is somewhat separate to this, but something to consider, if we are reviewing the policy for board members to, can, to attend um, virtually, how does that, or should we also be thinking about how that might impact our public comment section? Mm -hmm. And so if it is okay for us to consider from, from our perspective, what about the public and what does that say about what, what we allow now? Mm -hmm. I, I agree, I, I flagged, um, the, may prevent the physical presence of board members or other necessary meeting participants, mm -hmm. which I think is written broadly and might include the superintendent and our solicitor or other administrators or presenters, but um, public comment is a required um, portion of our meeting. And I think that does then kind of raise the question there. And I also will say I, um, under the authority section, Dr. King, I hear your interpretation that it's for um, kind of emergency situations, but um, I'm not sure that I read the phrasing that way. It says for factors such as illness, travel, schedule, conflicts, weather conditions, and then it says and other emergency situations that might imply those ones are um, emergency, but it also could just be like, oh, I'm just going right. to be like calling from my cabin for the next three months or something like that. and. Um, that, that's something I'd, I would have concerns about. And I was noticing that in um, the DCIU version of it, theirs, theirs uses the language, but only under extraordinary yes. circumstances. But then those aren't defined. Mm -hmm. And so that also then leaves interpretation of what that means. And I, I do wanna just go back to what Dr. King said about if this is the policy we have, then what does that mean for pressure for someone who is currently living under extraordinary um, circumstances to feel obligated that they then have to participate? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is also, if we're going to make it be only about extraordinary circumstances, then do we even want to have this? Because then it puts a lot of pressure on a s singular board member mm -hmm. um, versus maybe having something that's in place for extraordinary experience circumstances that we all couldn't meet together, then we we look at that for all of us. Right, and that, yeah, and I don't really cut anyone off if anyone else wanted to um, add something, but you know, that was my takeaway as well. I really appreciate being able to look at the DCIU's um, policy and how, um, you know, their, um, their policy was written. I think it's helpful because they're clear, I think they are looking at it from extraordinary circumstances, but if there's an extraordinary circumstance that would need a meeting that maybe you couldn't have a quorum if, if someone didn't re participate remotely, then maybe the whole board should just be remote. And then, you know, you know you have um, the same accessibility for everyone. If there is some sort of extenuating circumstance like weather or something that would have, you know, public comment would be able to be remote in that scenario when the whole board is remote. And um, I think that would get to the extraordinary circumstance mm -hmm. That, that the policy is looking to get to, but is not, um, doesn't have the possibility of potential misuse by someone who maybe wants to live in a different township, a different county, a different state um, for you know six months out of the year or something and say, oh, well, I'm scheduling conflict, can't make it for six months. So, um, you know, I think it, it is important for the board members to have a physical presence in the township. And um, so, I, I don't think that we've seen a need for this. I mean, I've obviously only been on the board for um, two years, two and a half years, but um, 
you know, a single board member sometimes does have to miss a meeting um, because they're on vacation or because they're sick, um, you know, their kids are sick, something, and that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, we have a policy that, that addresses that already. So um, if everyone agrees, maybe we look at um, <clears throat> making this just about having um, virtual board meetings. Is there a, a policy that recommend, like the for specifically virtual board meetings, or is it something we would just revise this for? Gen generally, what districts are doing um, in that circumstances, they're kind of crafting it out of the out model. of this. Okay, right. I would just think that you would just change the language to have a lot of the similar language, but instead of saying a board member, it would just say the meeting, right? Correct. Um, and one of the things I like about that is the technology does in those circumstances allow for the, we have a video platform. This has the baseline just to be able to hear and be heard. Um, but I think participation is enhanced when somebody is also seeing the presentation and mm -hmm. um, you know we have the video capacity there. Um, I just wanna throw a couple of things in. I, I, I agree that I don't want to enable somebody to only participate remote, a board member specifically, to only participate remotely because I don't think that's the intent of what we're trying to do here, um, nor do I think that's appropriate. Um, but I do like a policy that would allow for occasional board member um, remote attendance. I'm just thinking of a case where like, you know, I'm traveling for work, but there's something on the agenda that I really want to have a voice in. I want to be able to attend virtually and this policy would allow me to do that, but it doesn't obligate me to do that. And I, I like that flexibility. Um, and I do think the language that's here, like you have to submit a request to the board president three days prior to the meeting. So presumably, it do, what it doesn't say though, is that the president has to approve that. And so I think that's the language we need to add, you know, with, with president approval, then you attend remotely. And I think that's the piece that would keep it from being abused, right? You ask for the request, the president requests it, approves it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody were living away and trying to attend every meeting remotely, presumably we would have a president that would say that that's not appropriate and would deny that request and say, you need to be here physically. Um, but I also like the DCIU policy that says, um, I guess the, the ordinarily a majority of the board members will be physically present and then kind of goes into the extraordinary circumstances such as mandated closures, a disaster, emergency, a pandemic. Um, then, you know, that's where everyone would meet. So I kind of like having the flexibility as a board member to attend remotely as an individual on occasion if I choose to do so. And then something else added to the policy such as this kind of a paragraph that would um, allow all of us to be remote in the same, like on Zoom or whatever. Um, what I don't like about the DCIU policy is a meeting through electronic communications. That makes it sound like, well, email is okay, or like <laughs> we could just, you know, have a chat. Like that, I feel like that language is really vague. I don't think that's the appropriate language. I don't think we want to say through electronic communication. I want, I think something maybe more clear would, would be appropriate, right? Because that does, I mean, email is electronic communications, right? A phone call is electronic communications. I think what we're saying is through like some sort of more formal video conferencing, video platform. conferencing yeah. platform, right? Um, so that that was the one language in the, in the DCIU policy I, I thought was maybe not what I would prefer. Anyway, okay, that's all I had. I think I, I totally get where you're coming from. I think the flexibility is desirable. I guess I just still see that there there could be abuse of it. Um, and, you know, I definitely empathize with, you know, there's something on the agenda that I would want to talk about, but I'm, you know, either physically or just, um, you know, otherwise not able to attend the meeting. But I'm not sure that that's reason enough to create the policy just because... I think in that circumstance, it's if there's a quorum of the board, I mean, there's nine board members and obviously every board member's voice is important, but um, at that point, the other eight board members would just have to take the vote and, and talk about it. Um, so I, I, 
I, I definitely, because I, like I, I sort of was looking at this too. I think that's why we originally brought this because there are times that you, you know, but for your just physical location, uh -huh. or you know, a couple weeks ago I had to miss a meeting because my kids were sick, yeah. um, and you know, but I, I literally watched the meeting as it was happening, and so I, you know, I could have, <laughs> I, I, um, I, <laughs> I could have attended right virtually if we had this, but I think, um, I just see, I just see too much misuse of it, poten potential misuse in the future. Um, and my concern, like I said, is the board members or other necessary meeting participants and trying to figure mm -hmm. out how that all applies mm -hmm. and how we make those accommodations. Yeah. Right, okay. because then we also have our, like our contractors, for example, who we want to come to the meeting, we want to have um, we present at the meeting, and then maybe they every single time say, oh, well, can I participate remotely, right? And is that what we want? Do we want all of our presenters to be participating remotely? And, um, you know... Mm -hmm. I, in theory, the board president could say, no, you know, you're not going to do this. But I just, like I said, I, I don't know how practical that would be, how practical of an obstacle that would be. Um, not to say anything about Ms. Wiedemann. But again, like we're, we're trying to look into the future for exactly, these. Yeah. You know, it's not just this board. It, it, this policy could apply to a board with nine different people on it. And so I'm um, just trying to think about the future. Dr. Rishi, can you think of examples or cases where the, like not having this policy has been a challenge for people that we wanted to have at the board meeting. Not having the policy meeting if someone has requested to participate virtually. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of people who either we ask or ask themselves to you know come to a meeting to make a presentation, whether it's you know someone a consultant that we've been working with or mm -hmm. you know or a contractor um we've been able to say if you can't be here on such and such a night we'll arrange another time for you to be here mm -hmm. so it that has not presented any dif any difficulties you know for us that way um, you know if you decide to move forward with this policy you can limit the you know the number of time like during the cool period of time that a board member could participate in up to mm -hmm. you know, two meetings virtually right. that would be if you you know choose to go in that direction um, but not having it has not created a problem for us so it sounds like there's <laughs> still two <laughs> schools of thought one of it's a benefit to have the flexibility for a board member um, or perhaps other people necessary to the meeting to select to participate when they have other circumstances that would otherwise not allow them to be present in the room. Um, and then another kind of way of thinking is that the expectation is that the meeting is conducted in the room in person. I have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, 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 I feel that if, if you are on vacation or if you are ill, if, if there's something that prevents you from physically being here, I'm going to guess that it also prevents you from being 100% mentally in, in attendance. Um, so I see the perspective of, you know, does this now create out of a time period where it was necessary to interact that way mm -hmm. does it now create well maybe this is the way that we can right. you know can can do things um when we were all home and that's what we were focused on like that was our schedule i'm going to have the meeting from this area of my house and but i wasn't home because I wasn't feeling well or, or um, I was on vacation. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it was, that's where I was working from that period of time. So I would hesitate to see that become the norm mm -hmm. for our meeting participation. Right, and I guess I'm thinking about the remote potential for the whole remote, for the whole board to be remote um, I could see a scenario where there needs to be a special meeting, um, you know, that because it requires the vote of the board, but, you know, schedules don't align because it was a special meeting. It didn't, wasn't necessarily on the calendar. And so in order to have a quorum, in order to have a quorum, we would need 
the whole board to be remote, mm -hmm. something like that. You know, and so if we wanted to have a policy for extraordinary circumstances for the board to be remote, that's why I was thinking, you know, that could that's maybe alleviate question. this problem, um, the issue of maybe we, you know, the reason is if one board member doesn't come in um, virtually, then we don't have a quorum. It's like, okay, well, we'll just even the playing field for everybody. Mm -hmm. Dr. Crispin, have I convinced you or? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't wanna, <laughs> I, I, I see both sides of it and I, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like it's been a problem that people have really wanted to attend remotely, like while they're on vacation or something, right? Like that doesn't seem like a problem. I was just thinking that um, it is nice to have the option to do that. So if you so choose, right? Um, but I don't know that it's necessary to do that, right? Um, and I definitely see your point that, you know, if you're on vacation, like you're on vacation and you're not necessarily like 100% focused, but um, I, I, but I, I definitely think we need something on, uh, like we need some policy about the entire board being virtual in, the, in like a very specific circumstance kind of scenario. Mm -hmm. um, so why don't we, we, Justin and I take a look at, at crafting <laughs> language around um, the primary focus being the circumstances with which the board would need to be and the meeting would need to be entirely virtual mm -hmm. and we can include language at the end that would you know in an emergency situation for up to two times or what, like if a board member needed to do that and then you can take a look at that and see okay, okay. i would say too i think one of these not, I think it was our policy, not the DCIU policy, but it also discussed like committee meetings and executive sessions, information sessions. I'm not sure that we would need that mm -hmm. because they don't, they don't need, like they're not, um, you know, obviously executive sessions are with our attorneys and uh, privileged materials and things like that. And so they're not public to begin with. Um, and then committee meetings, I think we would just, <laughs> like Dr. Rushi said before, I mean, reschedule the committee meeting if the committee couldn't make it. Right. And so I don't think, I think yeah. that if we were going to apply it, it would be to, um, general board meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay. <laughs> I d didn't want to kick any more down the road. <laughs> but it's okay. Um, but I think, you know, this is just trying to come to a resolution on that one. Hopefully. Are we ready to move on? I think so. Yes, let's, yes. Yeah, let's okay. do it. Um, so th the next um, policy for tonight's consideration is 919. That's civility. Um, that is back before the committee um, because it impacts uh, both 904 and 906. Uh, and my understanding is that we wanted to solidify um, the committee's intent um, for how 919 is going to progress before moving forward with 904 and 906. Yeah, thank you. Um, so 999, nine, oh, I'm, yeah, right, it's just misnumbered. Okay, so 919 um, would be a new policy. It would be on civility. Um, the way that it's drafted right now, it would provide, I guess, potentially a, um, a new avenue for someone to create a complaint um, with the district and I had um, several concerns about this. I think obviously promoting mutual respect, civility, um, orderly conduct uh, between and with board members, employees, contractors, parents, guardians, students, everyone um, that comes into contact with our school district is obviously important. It's something that I don't think is controversial. Um, we would all you know, want to be civil towards each other. But um, you know, I guess I'm not sure that this needs to be, I'm not sure that, that, that scenarios in which this would occur um, that, would, that would rise to the level of an issue the district would want to um, monitor isn't already covered by our other policies. And so um, to me, I'm not sure, I think that this is too broad, the way that it's written. Um, and I, I'm not even sure that we would want to have it be um, more than just we encourage civility. And so um, I don't think that we want to be um, the civility police. 
Um, you know, there's, I think this is a, like I said, I think it's a good policy to have among the board, um, for the board, for, um, for everyone in our community. But I don't think, you know, the way that it's written, it has some serious implications with, I think, too much ambiguity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, without getting into details, I mean, several times in the AR, something was listed that I couldn't think of a scenario of what I would have to do to violate this policy, right? And so if I don't, if I don't understand what counts as a violation, then um, I don't understand how to comply with the policy. And I think that that's um, not something that the district should be in the business of policing and not something that I think the, the, the district really wants to take on. Um, so I guess my, that all of that said, I don't think that I don't think that we necessarily need to not have this policy. Um, but I would add um, in the guidelines of the policy, for example, um, that nothing in this policy shall be construed as constricting any district approved curriculum materials or district approved curriculum topics. Um, the policy is not intended to affect delivery of de district approved curriculum in the district approved courses. Um, and then in delegation of responsibility, uh, I'm not sure that I would have this at all, this whole section. Um, and instead of making it something that the district is responsible for um, uh, monitoring and enforcing, really just have it be more of a policy of, you know, this is how we hold ourselves out and this is how we want to act towards each other. Um, I mean, I can go through the ARs and tell you the ones that I'm, I'm concerned about. But it's mostly all of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, you know, one of them is being disruptive to the orderly operation of the district. And I just, I don't know what that means. Um, what, is, what is order? Um, what's a disruption? How big of a disruption? Um, what is op what's the operation of the district? I mean, what would rise to the level of this policy being broken? So. Um, gone down a lot of slippery slopes, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, that's my proposal for this one is, um, you know, because for, just another example <laughs> before I, I, I take it off my soapbox, um, you know, this really seems to, um, implicate anyone who would be in our district at any of our, at any of our district events or at any, um, you know, something on district property. And my, my first thought was, um, if you're at a football game, somebody gets mad, you know, one adult gets mad at another adult and they maybe don't act civil towards each other. Do they have a complaint with the district now? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think the district wants to handle that complaint. <laughs> um, I don't think that's, that's, uh, the place of the district. And, um, so I, th you know, and I think that we have, uh, we have really good policies already on harassment and, um, you know, threatening behavior. Um, so I'm not sure that we need to add this. Uh, another one. <laughs> well, I, I completely agree. Um, I've read it through three times now since it, since you've been talking about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was talking that long that you committed know, three times. Like, my point in saying that is that I, was, I kept reading it hoping that it would be better the next time around, that I would find something that could be useful or that could be clearly defined and, um, and used in our district. And so I struggle with every single line, particularly under the guidelines and absolutely under the delegation of responsibility. Mm -hmm. None of those things from my perspective should be the responsibility of anyone in our district. Um, and, you know, you thought about a football game. I thought about, like, simple stuff. Sometimes the drop-off line can get a little, a little crazy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, someone comes down the wrong way or someone lets their kid out. We're not supposed to. This could go yeah. haywire very, very quickly. And I feel like let's avoid that at all costs. Right. I mean, one of the... <laughs> One of these examples was profanity. So I, the district could spend all of their time policing <laughs> profanity. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't, what are other thoughts of the committee members on whether we should have this policy at all, whether we should have something much shorter? 
one idea is like I said, I think you positioned it well as a like a value statement. Um, and we do have as the board, we've adopted the PSBA principles of governance. Um, it's not part of our policies, but that is an option to, to have that be um, embedded in our policy. But it is a similar kind of values in relation to like those policies or those um, cover advocating earnestly, lead responsibly, govern effectively, plan thoughtfully, evaluate continuously, communicate clearly, act ethically. Um, I think in that line, you know, this, um, those are specifically for board members and how we conduct ourselves in, um, in this role. But um, I think this policy on civility does broaden it. it. It looks to board members, employees, parents and guardians, students, volunteers, coaches, members of the public when they are engaged in our school activities. Um, but having that same um, expectation of, of behavior without um, for the reasons you've listed, the, the kind of um, complaint and monitoring and discipline, I think would be a more worthwhile addition to, and a more manageable addition than, than what's drafted. And I think in that scenario, we don't even have ARs because there's nothing right. for the district mm -hmm. to, to. Um, to implement. And so, you know, if we did want to go forward with something like that, I think we just strike the ARs completely and um, would just have the first two sections of the policy. And again, I had some revisions to the guidelines, making sure that, you know, we talk about topics in schools that are unsettling sometimes, um, you know, that's part of learning. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't want this to be up applied to that. And um, I, I mean, and either way, I just, I don't think that it should be the source of a complaint. I just, I agree that like, I have a problem with just the word civility to begin <laughs> with, because I feel like it's a very loaded word. It comes mm -hmm. with a lot of different bias perspective of what it means. And I don't think this policy as written clarifies for me what it means. Um, and so for me, that creates even a space that just being uncomfortable, someone could claim you're not mm -hmm. being civil. And I, I just, I think it, it creates too much reinterpretation um, of other people's intentions and other people's impact. Um, I don't know necessarily if this is what we want in a policy or not, but I just keep thinking we're in the business not business, but like we're, our purpose here is to create environments that are learning opportunities for our children. And so in that sense, for me, I would like there to be something that we're saying, we expect adults in this environment to be behaving in ways that we want to model to our children, the ways that we want them to, to behave. And yeah, that might be couched under civility, but I don't think the word civility itself um, gets us there. Mm. Um, like the description of courtesy, respect, dignity, kindness, um, those are also words that can be interpreted in multiple different ways. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I don't like civility <laughs> as a term. Um, I think it's creating a space where we're policing behavior um, that really we have other business to be doing. Yeah. So I guess I wonder, yes, but I, I, I really appreciate Ms. Wiedemann's point about um, the board's uh, code of conduct. What, sorry, what was it that we adopted? The principles of governance. Prin the principles of governance, right, through PSBA. Um, something, you know, we've already adopted that for ourselves. And um, maybe maybe that's that's enough. I don't I don't know that we that we need this. Um, certainly we expect ourselves to hold out mm -hmm. um, uh, just like Dr. McKay was saying on, you know, to be models for the students in our district. Um, but do we, do we need this to be codified in a, in a policy? There are student codes of conduct. <laughs> yes. Right. That they have. And I know even for sports, like the PIAA has statements that, you know, that they will announce at the beginning of 
a game or an event to say, you know, these are the expectations for um, sportsmanship and um, competition. But um, yeah, so I think there are other ways that this topic is reinforced and made part of our school environment. Mm -hmm. Are we coming to a consensus that we just don't want to have this policy? I mean, yeah. I was just going to raise that. Um, so then I think the way, I don't think we necessarily need to go over 04 and 06 unless our solicitor tells us differently. And I think we would just strike the, the civility, the reference to the civility poli policy from those policies. Okay. Okay, so we moved this one off. This one's done. <laughs> it's not coming back. <laughs> So I guess I do have the question just looking at, at 04. Um, the second paragraph uses the word civility. Um, so are we comfortable con keeping the language there when it's not explicitly defined? So it says that in 04, the district expects mutual respect, civility, and orderly conduct by all individuals attending school events on district property. I'm looking at the wrong one. I know, I don't uh, Maybe I I'm looking the, at the wrong yeah, one. I'm the not policy 904? No, I see it, that it's Oh, it's in the ARs. Oh, okay. Oh, it is in the ARs, apologize. I don't feel as strongly about striking that. I just wanted to, to make a note of it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think we can keep it. Um, but I think any reference to the policy of civility, I mean, in this case, this would just be the reference to the, to what civility means, um, you know, um, in its ordinary course and not necessarily under our policies. Um, and it is in the context of very explicit behavior. There's a list right. of expected behavior. Yeah. And so, and, and this one is not, um, and they are, it isn't punishing policy that is considered to be incivil. Um, whereas I think in the policy itself, we do need to strike incivility uh, as part of the definition. Because it's um, enumerated within the policy itself. Where are you, where are you yeah, I'm looking? Um, at the 904 as well? I think so. Let me. Maybe I'm looking at an old one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, under the definitions, it's discrimination slash harassment slash incivility. Oh, yeah. So we would just want to strike incivility from that. Although I don't think it references the policy itself. Um, Is it in the ARs of 9062? I believe so. I'm thinking back to you know, some of the presentations yes. we've had of students. Um, students coming in, particularly from the elementary school, talking about their um, character traits or you know their citizenship and um, things like that. I'm wondering, I'm trying to remember, like what were the words that they used um, to define, um, you know, their responsibility as citizens of the school and the way they, they behave. Um, civility, I don't think was was one I don't of think them. The but kids use that word. <laughs> no. yeah. yeah. So I think this in the formal complaint procedure, that paragraph should just be stricken. The complaints received that fail to comply yeah, with civility standards. Mm -hmm. And then I guess this would need a first read again, right? I think. It should come back just because these are, I mean, um, well, I mean, it, it, it actually could, it could move forward because we, we can make substantive revisions and, and move it forward to the. Okay. The Cause we've, I think we've already read it twice. Yeah. Yeah. So we yeah. could just move forward. Okay. And we can, if the full board wants to review it again, we can table it so we could have it on the agenda. And then if we feel like there's something about it that needs to not move forward, we can table it or discuss it at that time.
it is referenced in 906 in the yeah. in the policy as well at the bottom of the first page yep. comply with provisions of board policy and administrative guideline 920 civility yes there yeah. are, there are multiple okay so yeah so it'll just <laughs> it'll just need to be stricken okay. we, we trust for you word. <laughs> yeah okay thank you <laughs> all right So the committee is comfortable with 919, which is not going to move forward at all. Mm -hmm. And 904 and 906 can move to the first read then. Or would, it would move to being voted on because it's already had a first and second read, right? 904, 906? 904. We definitely read it at least once. <laughs> at least so there's, once. I, so there's, a, there's been a first one. reading. It says back from the first. I think we only read it once. Yeah. I think we held on to it because we knew that we needed okay. to talk about the civility. So I think it's been read once okay. in, so we'll in go, the general. It would go to the board for a second for a reading. Second, yeah. It would go for a second reading then. Okay. So just to, both just to clarify, when I'm looking at policy 906 mm -hmm. i know we talked about so this line will be removed from the guidelines one two third paragraph mm -hmm. where it's referring mm -hmm. to administrative guideline 920 is that coming off yes yes so that whole sentence or just that section there i think the board requires all complaints made pursuant to this policy comply with the provisions of board policy period period, <laughs> period. okay that's ending there okay thank you First reading is April 21st, so it's just been for. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was doing the search as well. <laughs> it wasn't read May 5th, so. Okay. So that brings us to, and we're comfortable moving on from those mm -hmm. yep. three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that would be the next one would be the communications policy. It's tentatively 920. I know there was discussion about what the number would be. Um, mm -hmm. I think, the, I think we have an existing 920. Oh no, I'm sorry, we don't. No, we don't. We don't have an existing 920. So I. I, I think there were references to civility being both 919 and 920. That so was yeah, an issue was as confusing. well. Yeah. That was an issue as well. Um, so I'm just going to refer to it generally as the communications policy, since the numbers to be determined. Um, we made a recommendation that the district consolidate four um, current policies um, into a single policy and. Uh, there was discussion at the last committee meeting um, regarding PSBA models. I misspoke at that meeting. Um, what I had envisioned was a combination of, of two PSBA models. Um, it's PSBA model 911, which is news and media relations, and uh, model 902, I believe. 901, I'm sorry, uh, which is public relations objectives. Uh, one which really focuses on the goals of the policy and, and then 911 um, really hones in on on the application um, so it, and, and it's very it's sim they're both similar to mm -hmm. what the district has in place but there are some language updates um, so what we've done is we've um, isolated both of those policies for the committee's review um, but then also uh, presented you with a recommended um, single policy if you will that combines the two and, and does a little bit of rearranging as far as uh, the structure of the policy and, and where it would make more sense to have different sections. Um, so that, th that's really what we've done as far as a general communications recommendation. It's one of those- Could I just clarify? So 901 and 911 would be deleted or they would still exist? Nine, 901, um, they could be. I mean, it, we could combine it under one heading Mm -hmm. um, we could we could create a new number. Um, it probably, I mean, it, it's really the the board's pleasure. I mean, we could just re, we could retitle um, and and make those additions as well. So there there are a couple of different options that you have. Okay. So, just to be clear, this communications policies would replace which one of our current policies? O one, O two, ten, ten, and eleven. Ten and eleven. 1, 2, 10, and 11. Right. And so, okay. And so that's what we have in front of us here to consider as the large communications policy. And then what we're also looking at that our solicitor has provided is 901 
PSBA, which corresponds with our current 901? It's, it's similar. Um, I believe yours was last updated in 2010. Ten. So mm -hmm. there are some changes since then. Okay. <laughs> and then 911 as well would correspond with our current 911, which again, certainly has not been updated recently. 1999. <laughs> 1999. Um, I, I think that a lot of these policies are just so redundant, 01, 02, 10, and 11, that it makes a lot of sense to keep put them in one policy. It's easier to follow, I think, for the public and for the district to have it all in one place. Um, but that said, I have comments. <clears throat> So I don't know if anyone else's thoughts on structure, we can go over that before, I'm, and then I can, I'm happy to discuss my specific comments. I like the idea of consolidating, especially when the topics are so, so similar. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. I agree. Okay. Because this is like media and then the different positions within the administration. Like, it just makes sense to put it all together of like the overall communications and then this is how it applies to different people within the district. Right. Instead of having a separate policy for each, yeah. So I am on board with combining um, the policies, but I do have a question regarding one of the guidelines. Um, okay, so guideline two, which term. policy are you? I'm looking at the. <laughs> Which of the four files are you looking at? <laughs> I'm looking at the combined the. Okay. The, the word doc. The word doc. Okay. Yeah. 920. Okay. Yeah. Do we, I have a lot of comments on this too. Do we want to go it in order? You, you say yours first, Dr. King, and then we can go through. Okay. So just so that I am clear before I start going through, this will be replacing the others. And so we're looking to pull from, and, and this is the go to. Yes. Right? Okay. All right, so if but this, that's an option, it that's an sounds option. like that's the if, way that this committee is interested if, in, if but it's not, it's not a requirement, but it sounds like that's okay. what we're kind of getting our head around. Okay, so my questions are coming from the standpoint of that's where we're going. So that's why I wanted to be clear about that. So if that's where we're potentially going, if I look at guideline um, number two, determine what residents expect from their schools and what they want to know about the school's programs and operations. We have a little bit of clarification for that. And this is, I'm sorry, this is in the, the, the policy? The this is the guide, this the is the word doc. The 920 communication. It's the file called one. draft communication policy. Okay, go down. Here it is. Oh, just a second. Okay. So this is, this is, again, this is optional language that's recommended by, or I guess not recommended, but um, created by PSBA okay. um, for districts to consider. And, and so I guess that's all prefaced with the objectives of the program. Okay. Um, so the thought that comes to my mind is um, it's, it's really enhancing communications with your school communities because different schools within the district or mm -hmm. um, you know, different parents or guardians are looking for different things. Uh, you know, it might be different in, in, in an intermediate school or a high school than it is in an elementary school. Okay. Um, I, think, um, I think your point's well taken though. It's, it's pretty esoteric and, yeah. and, <laughs> and lacking some. <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's a theme. And and I will say, and I was just about to say this before we we shifted directions. This is this is a policy that there's not a lot of school code mm -hmm. okay. legal kind of requirement to, mm -hmm. and so it, it really um, it really does require input from the board and and perhaps even you know various administrators because um, in practice what you know what is focused on and what needs to be developed and enhanced. Um, there really, there really isn't necessarily one size fits all that PSBA is going to capture and okay. and recommended language. Okay, I, I know that was a very <laughs> roundabout way of answering. Okay, all right. So I, I, I certainly that makes a lot more sense. And so for a layer or two or ten of what number two is, I think we would need to tease that out a bit. Yeah. It's absolutely helpful to know. Um, and, and there's a balance between what residents expect and what's realistic and what is useful 
because I could expect something as a resident and it's not necessarily useful from the, from the district's perspective. So um, allowing administration certainly to weigh in and then the temperature check for our, our township. Um, I think that that could be massaged a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my initial comment. I'll let someone else go. I will, I will say it's striking me as we're talking about this that um, I just did a PSBA board leadership training and the topic was communication. And, um, you know, obviously the importance of communication, the value that it has in establishing relationships and supports for our students and supports for our school program with the community and taxpayers and, and you know, definitely a priority. But um, one of the suggestions was to have like a communications plan, a communication strategy document, which doesn't sound like board responsibility, you know, like could we look at this more for the lens instead instead of saying the guidelines, you have to come up with a uh, strategy mm -hmm, right. for communications that hits on these six things, but just, you know, turn it back to the administration to say, you know, the board wants there to be a communication strategy and plan. Um, something, you know, a little more high level and, and let some of the specifics be determined um, at the at the district level is one thing that's struck me. Um, another in in the policy looking at it, the authority um, to achieve this purpose, the board shall provide parents, guardians and other district residents opportunities to receive information and orientation regarding the schools. The board will utilize all appropriate means and media to achieve its public relations objectives. I think throughout every place where it says all, all staff, all aspects of the district, all this, I, that is a concern to me that mm -hmm. that just sets a bar that seems no stone very unturned un un yeah. unrealistic um so and to your point uh, dr king about all appropriate means like what you know what does that mean who's the arbiter of what what those forums are so um i would kind of step back on on some of those bold expectations as written into policy mm -hmm. under authority um is it the board that's providing parents and guardians and district residents these opportunities or is it the administration? Is that our responsibility or is that like we're so, authorizing the superintendent and her and her staff? Her like that seems a little outside of the scope of what the board does. Is that right? I mean the board does need to communicate, but board and administration does seem like a joint responsibility. So I don't know, like to provide parents and guardians and other district residents opportunities to receive information and orientation regarding the schools. Like that makes it seem like the board is like, come on into our schools and like <laughs> check them out and see what you think. Like that is not our role. No. That would be the superintendent's role. So I think that's a little unclear in there. Like, yes, it is our role to ensure that there is effective communication, but it feels like the way that this is written, it's just, it feels like that's not what we're mm -hmm. supposed to be doing, right? So I think you could, the board shall direct district personnel to provide parents and guardians and other district opportunities to receive information. And I really didn't like the word orientation either yeah. because um, I didn't know what it meant. And to me, it, it literally meant going to school. Yeah, that's what I think of as an orientation. <laughs> so, is like, yeah, freshman orientation. Um, I would strike that as well. Yeah. And just, you know, opportunities to receive information regarding the schools. And that we will use, uh, appro you know, maybe the district will use appropriate means and media to achieve its public relations objectives. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think using the district, because I don't think it's the board specifically, mm -hmm. I think changing that language to the district, because mm -hmm. I really think it is more of an operation as opposed to what we are doing. Yeah. Number four kind of made me chuckle a bit. Communicate factual information to avoid rumors and communication crises. I. I hope that we are doing that. I trust that we are. Um, and, and, and removing the, the avoiding the rumors and factual information, is there something else that is useful that we can have there in terms of what we are intending to communicate versus just saying don't spread rumors, <laughs> which is how I read that. And I think it's also the 
a vacuum of information is an opportunity so that during, you know, keep people informed right. and aware so that stuff just doesn't get conjured up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I if we're going to leave these objectives at all, I think we strike number four because that doesn't add anything as an objective. And it complicates things, I think. <laughs> right. Are we supposed to address every move? Is the district supposed to address every rumor? You know, um, I was, yeah. it's impossible to even know, know what all the rumors are. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's a new rumor on TikTok every day. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I like Ms. Wiedemann's idea that I'm not sure we even need all these guidelines to be so specific mm -hmm. and to say, you know, the objective of the district communication program, you know, shall be explained in the district's communications strategic plan or something like that. And um, it, these, these do strike me as odd because the ARs are also pretty specific. And so do we need these guidelines when we're already saying what the purpose is? I mean, some of these are okay, I guess, but I'm not sure that we need them. Um, pull up the ARs. So for me, the ARs as well, continue to be really broad and I'm left after most of them wondering what it actually means and pra and like practicality like how does this actually work um yeah like as it almost gets to the point of drafting someone's job description which seems unusual mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. context of other policies and ARs that we have I mean, it just feels like each of the steps under district staff, to me, I don't really know what a lot of it would, like what it's actually saying has to happen. If, if I may, I think the, the major points we want to focus on really are creating a protocol for, for how media inquiries are handled. Okay. Um, that's one primary focus. Another is who is going to be the, the district spokesperson um, when when uh, comments need to be made or um, responses need to be given um, and then um, having a you know kind of a set of guidelines for um, staff members uh, because sometimes um, the request for for these materials goes to a staff member or a classroom teacher rather than going through central building, either building or central administration. Um, so having those kind of rules in place um, are something that, that that's something that we need, but then the, the rest of it as far as, um, you know, creating a communications pro program or what the goals of that program will be, um, that's kind of left open for, for discussion and, and I guess the input of the board. Am I missing where there is like that hierarchy of like this is these are the people that address the media in this document? Maybe I'm not looking at the right the, one. So the because I agree with you, like that to me makes the perp like that's what a policy should be. So the the regulation, um, one of the the headings at the top is chief communications representative, mm -hmm. um, and then again there are those kind of optional suggestions well, it's yeah. from PSBA as to what that's supposed to look mm -hmm. like. So in the sense then like to say that the superintendent or their designee is the first space and then from there it gets delegated down. Yes. So like the statement then we move into district staff that statement isn't really made. So like under district staff would it then need to be as as directed by the superintendent instead of being assumed to be at all times and in every moment mm -hmm. right right i mean a theme with this is um the you know just like what was said earlier the use of the word all mm -hmm. is is um it just 
this is folks' job, right? And they have times of their job that they're expected to be here. And um, I don't think that the all, the use of the word all reflects that. Um, I mean, give courteous and thoughtful consideration to all inquiries and suggestions and carefully investigate all complaints. I mean, that's not even the, this, that's not even particular district staff's job, right? Because there are certain complaints that need to be investigated by certain district staff as outlined in our other policies. And so it's, it's, um, it's too vague and too all encompassing most of these bullets. Yeah, and I think what's really the important part of that refers to, you know, staff members shall not give mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. interviews as requested by, you know, by mm -hmm. media without pro without prior approval, mm -hmm. and and then talking about photographs of a controversial nature or questionable with, with regard to individual rights and privacy, um, you know, and, and requests for those photographs. I mean, that that's where, as a staff member, someone could you know really look at it and say well that's not something that i should do or mm -hmm. right i am allowed to do certain things yeah, i would like this document to be one that like employees understand okay if i do have a request done who do i go to who do i make sure that it is appropriate for me to go about that which i could be in an employee handbook of course but like having this just be a really clear media communications As far as the, the the regulation is concerned, would it make sense then to um, go back to the drawing board, so to speak, with administration and, and try to get some feedback as far as um, what are our current practices and, and where we think mm -hmm. um, there's some room to grow or what we'd like to codify? And I think as you point out, there are several like key objectives that we want right. to have in here and the rest seems to be a distraction. So really focusing on those things that are beneficial and helpful to the way that the district operates. That's what I was just gonna say. I would, I would expect to see the next version of this to be much more narrow, mm -hmm. much shorter, um, you know, fewer enumerated points um, because this just really isn't the place for a lot of this. And then we're putting too much of a burden I think, on 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 staff. Yeah, agree. Is this just for my own clarification? Is this also the space that like someone in the community who wants information or an interview or this would then could go to this and know this is the person within the district I should contact, because it's clear that's the person. I like. Are we wanting this to also be utilized not just for staff but also for community and media who might want to communicate mm -hmm. with the district? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That that would. The example you just gave it would fall under this. Mm -hmm. The way it's drafted now, it sounds like it would all go in through Dr. Rishi's office and then they would right. be directed to Anna Deacon as you know, communications or a principal or something like that. But it, like the way it's set up is the representative, the chief communications representative is the superintendent or designee. One question I had, and this would be more of a, a legal nature, um, when it does say that the um, you know, there are restrictions on information that staff members can give to news media. Is there kind of legal precedent or protocol for that that we need to be mindful of? Is that an accepted practice or is that a, a restriction of somebody's rights to communication? No, and that's a, that's a great point. Um, it probably should be fleshed out more. I think it's, I think it's one of those instances where um, you know, again, PSBA um, has a model, and it it could probably be perfected um, or couched within. I, like in some of these, yeah, letters, there it, are like understanding that because there somebody is, doesn't give up their First Amendment rights because they are employed or whatever that you know. But there are these protocols that right, and there are certainly district matters that staff should not be talking to the media about right, right. even if they get an inquiry and so um i think it would be good for i'm sure but, you know i would assume this type of thing is in an employee handbook right and um there are times that you know personal information about a student or about an, something that happened in the schools you know should not be um disclosed to the media so um i think it's important it's, i would think it's important to have this in here 
but with the qualifiers, right? With, you know, there are there are Absolutely. inappropriate times for, mm -hmm. and maybe even refer to the, like the employee handbook or something with the, there are better explanations of it there. Right, other places where privacy is required or um, any handling of sensitive information. Mm -hmm. We can certainly elaborate um, further and make sure that um, there's more of an explicit balance within the language. Um, my only comment is really on the ARs as they relate to the draft of the policy. I know it's all going to change, of course, before the next version, but um, the guidelines read in the policy, the guidelines read more about communication between the district and community and families, less about the news media, the ARs read almost exclusively mm -hmm. about the news media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's what's missing from the ARs is like, we need a plan for communicating with our community and our students and parents and guardians, but we also need ARs for communicating directly with news media, right? So I think maybe the community and the students and their families, like that piece seems to be missing. Um, and I kind of like what Bridget said about having like a communication strategic plan, like that might be a useful place to have some of that AR. And, and the language. only, so the thought behind that is that oftentimes, right, so there's district-wide announcements, mm -hmm. but then a lot of times there's, there's um, individual school building announcements. And mm -hmm. since that, do, that is very fluid and changes mm -hmm. from school to school, mm -hmm. um, we weren't necessarily looking to make that something explicit Okay. within a regulation but we okay. can certainly i guess okay. maybe like a general yeah um just generally addressing mm -hmm. community communications yeah. um and we have 908 the relations with parents and guardians that's also pertaining to that communication mm -hmm. channel yeah. Um, yeah. um yeah i'm just thinking like if the ar is really only going to be about news media then it seems like the policy is really only about news mm -hmm. media as well right mm -hmm. so then do we need a communications policy broadly. Um, so just kind of thinking how the two things really tie together. Okay. That's all. Another aspect of it, and I'll just interject the thought and, and know that it won't be something we can handle all tonight, but um, you know, this is specifically referencing news media um, and like the news media relations talks about local press, radio and TV. I think a lot of the communications that the district does is social media too, which doesn't have the same, um, you know, somebody doesn't show up with their journalist credentials and, and start to ask questions. But I think it is a reality that the district operate in and um, not necessarily trying to like add all of that on, but I think there should be an awareness of social media, how we handle that, um, and, you know, that that might be part of the strategy and thinking too. Mm -hmm. um, and also maybe some limits on, you know, what our responsibility is to right. correct information that's out there different than if it were in a published um, mm -hmm. newspaper or, uh, you know, from a true news media source. I think that just is another reason to have a, a, a broader um, and less specific on the guidelines policy mm -hmm. um, and then ha really have these more of this minutia handled in the AR because social media for example can change all the time mm -hmm. and so it needs to be more fluid um, if we're going to have any sort of guideline about social media um, you know there could be a media in 10 years that we haven't thought of yet, but that's the main way that people get news. It just zaps into your brain. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, God, what comes after TikTok? <laughs> yeah. What? So, I mean, so I'd be hesitant to have any specific guidelines in the policy yeah. other than, you know, ha making sure that we have a communications policy and that we are being, um, you know, encouraging communication between people in the community, interested members of the community and the district. Um, I don't think I would have much more than that in the guideline itself and really just have the implementation left to the ARs. Certainly doable.
are we ready to move on to the next one? What is the next one? <laughs> 907. 907. 907. Okay. Look at us go. So 907 is school visitors. We are not rearranging numbers on this one or changing it. <laughs> this is only and one actually, policy. Actually, that is, that is something we should, before, I apologize, before we move on. <laughs> like we do want to rearrange them. <laughs> do we want... Um, do we want to, under this new combined communications policy, do we want to just use one of the existing numbers, um, 901, 902, 910, 911, rather than creating a new number? I think and someone raised that last time. Um, yeah, it was me. And I think I, it just makes the most sense to have a 901 yeah. because we have a section 900. Yeah. And since, since this is really, the whole section is about community, um, I think it would make sense for the very first policy in that section to be the communications with the community. And I think it's not that. I mean, it's the 901, our old 901 was what community objectives, mm -hmm. something. Community yes. relation objectives. Community relation objectives. So, I mean, I think this is the, our, our policy, I think, is shaping out to be something like that. Mm -hmm. With that, we will now move on to 907. <laughs> So 907 is school visitors. Um, we do have a current version of that. And all of these suggested revisions were, were are based off of, or we're working off of the, the district's current version. Um, some of the, the highlights, um, so, so, and again, I sh I'll say that this is one that there's, there's not a lot of legal regulation on, um, but some of the key points that we would ask the committee to consider. Um, distinguishing between um, family or, or guardian visitor, visitors to the district mm -hmm. or, or to schools, and then um, a professional uh, ob observations, which may be a part of a student's programming. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was one area where we strongly suggest that we, we add some type of language to regulate those types of visitors, um, the the military personnel, that is that is also a new addition that does come from uh, PSBA suggested language, and it does come right out of the school code. Um, so that's that's something we brought to the to the committee's attention. And then um, we're recommending that the agents and salespersons be removed because I think that's a little bit dated uh, for where we're at right now. I think this was the 1999 policy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? When textbooks used to be door to door. <laughs> yeah, October 21st, 1999. Traveling salesman. <laughs> okay. um, I think in reading this one, like when I think of my visits to school, it's more as a spectator. And um, I think it would be helpful kind of early on in this to distinguish that this is more for visits during the school day to observe the educational program rather than as an audience member for a play or a sporting event or walking around the art show kind of like they um this is a particular kind of a visit to the school during the course of the school day um on the policy itself, I don't have very many comments because it's very short now, mm -hmm. um, which I think is good. Um, but I would say um, the first sentence, the board welcomes and encourages interest in the district's educational programs and other school related activities. The board recognizes that such interest may result in visits to the school by parents slash guardians, adult residents of the community, educators and other officials. And then I would add uh, when appropriate and that's that's another theme of this policy is that I think that it's very broad and there are obviously times when the school would welcome a visitor and times when the school would not welcome a visitor mm -hmm. and we need to make sure that our policy allows for that flexibility that only the the people who are in the building running the building running the classrooms would know when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate and so I'm glad that you started with most of this is not um, legally required because that was one of my questions um i thought it was really detailed you know with how many visits you can have and when they can be and um 
And so I guess that is that that it's all just a holdover from our old policy. Is that um, it, part of it is um, the so the 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 regulate the school code regulations require reasonable reasonable access. Okay. Right. So um, many districts will choose to put a number on the visits. Um, I think we recommended two here per. I believe it's two per. Year. I think we have one we per do? marking period. I'm sorry. That's right. One per marking period. Two per. Two per year. year. Um, that's that's generally within a range that that most districts permit. Um, and again, that's I, and I think there is there's an explicit ability for that to be waived in, under certain circumstances. So it's it's really I think trying to capture what. What reasonable well, yeah, it would does. Be. It reads, you know, if you're coming in for a chaperoning a field trip or right. in as a room parent for some activity there, that that's not considered the visit, one of your visits, one of those right. visits. Yeah, I think the the way I read it in terms of you know one class period, you're actually going in while instruction is occurring. Yes, and and so and it, that's it's again with that that thought in mind of of trying not to burden the classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. um, with constant visitations. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think that's where putting that context up front, what this policy is really trying to regulate is access to the classroom to observe educational, educational proceedings, right? Like that that's, um, because right. even then, like that wouldn't, that wouldn't, I wouldn't think, right? Do we just let any adult member of the community come in and, and observe a classroom? That doesn't sound right. No. We're safe. Um, so then, <laughs> right, right. So then, I think in that second sentence um, about the interest in visits to the school from parents, guardians. Yes, I wouldn't say it's a, a other adult residents of the community. It could be officials or, or whatever. But I think we need to be more specific on who this pertains to and what situations it does, because um, one group that isn't in there that I was thinking of what, like who might come to observe the school could be prospective students. Is that something that happens like at the high school if students are considering transferring in or things like? That can happen, like arrangements for that can be can be made. Um, we're not, with the size of our high school, mm -hmm. um, it's not just like an open, anybody can come any day that they want and set up an appointment. Um, and also what they may do is not spend a whole day there. They may spend a portion of the day. So that might be an approved request that would need to follow some limits or guidelines, mm -hmm. right? But it's not the same as just any member of the community can say, I have an interest in observing school. So I think, yeah, we just need to limit or be more clear on what this policy's purpose is, who it applies to and when it's appropriate. I also don't, why was safety stricken in the first paragraph under purpose to promote order and then safety and safety was stricken in the schools and to protect students, employees in the educational environment. I think that when we're talking about allowing people coming into our school, safety is a very important um, factor to consider. And I, I would add that back in. Okay. Um, because I do think that it, um, you know, one of the questions I had was, do we expect folks who are using this policy to have clearances? Because I know that we expect our volunteers to have clearances when they're volunteering in the classroom. And um, as a parent, it's important to me that those are followed. But a visitor wouldn't be having interaction with the student, right? They're an observer, and maybe that could be more clear. Yeah, maybe that needs to be more clear. There are limits, like it's, it's you're not to interrupt or... Well, that was clear in the professional one. And so when we're talking about professional observations, it was quite clear that they could not um, interact with the students or interrupt. Um, you know, they can't have conversation or interaction with children or staff um, during the period of classroom or program observation. I'm not sure that was... That's not how I read the parent and guardian, guardian visitation, so I'm not sure that we want to have that limitation. But like I said, um, I don't, I don't, I mean, if, if, if the law or something says that we can't require clearances for just something as simple as a visit, 
then maybe that's fine, but maybe we need to put, you know, it's expected that um, all of our visitors are going to have proper clearances. You, you can't make a parent have clearances to observe their, their child's classroom. Can we encourage it? <laughs> I mean, you, you could, but they you would could draft that, I mean, I'm, they would never be the responsible person in that classroom, right? Like that's why we have somebody with clearances because they have, are like leading um, it. You know, they have some oversight responsibility of a child or a group of students. Okay, that's that direct the, contact. Yeah, like so. I'm picture, and maybe we could say, in no circumstance shall a visitor under this policy be a you know have direct contact with a student or something like that to specify yeah. that that's why it, it doesn't require the clearances I think that would be helpful to have that laid out better so in in under no sir just paraphrasing under mm -hmm. no circumstance will a visitor under this policy or pursuant to this policy have unsupervised contact with any student or staff or staff we need to define visitor <laughs> yeah, which is there. something that's done in the visitor volunteer or the volunteer yeah, like, policy does that too so yeah it could be cross-referencing there i agree that okay, because the the scenario i mean yeah. again a, 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 a parent a, a, or a parent we're saying a parent can't say hi to their child right i mean it, no, it, i think we're saying that they can't have direct supervision right like that's what they can't have they could certainly i mean i don't the way that it's written now you can talk to them it's you know there are the professional observations are much longer and more specific than the parent guardian visitations i guess i'm just trying to grapple with we we expect to have clearances in certain situations and not others and so let's clearly delineate what those are right well no <laughs> i i mean I, so what you're asking though is is you want a a notation that there's there's not going to be an expectation of clearances in this particular circumstances and an explanation of why i i guess what i want is why do okay why do we ha expect clearances in certain situations if and for whatever those situations are that require clearances specify that's not this okay right so as I understood oh, for okay. volunteers I I okay I right yeah. and and so you know just making clear that they're two different camps okay right so, so like volunteers and visitors mm -hmm. right so volunteers were expected to have clearances visitors are not is that what we're all saying or not saying that I don't know if it needs to be that black and white well the reason I, why I, the, re the reason why i use volunteers versus visitors so like i'm a home and parent so i'm there for all the parties and i'm from the time i open the door i've spoken to every single child that speaks to me um, but i also have my clearances on file different than if i'm coming there as a visitor observing mystery reader right <laughs> mystery reader at a, at a different school right mm -hmm. like i missed a red ad i forget i think manoa Vanilla. Yes, at Manoa, and my kid goes to Chestnut Walt. So um, the expectations I felt like there, I was a, a visitor. Right. That made, did I make mm -hmm. a clear yeah. difference there? And so I do think we need to have clear expectations for volunteers versus visitors. Right. Because my purpose for coming as, as a volunteer is much different from coming as a visitor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, and your interactions with the students, and and you know what what you're going to be doing in the classroom, right? And, right. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, I mean, I think like a lot of parents come in as visitors for parent-teacher conferences. They're not all going to get clearances before they come for a parent-teacher mm -hmm. conference. I don't think that's a reasonable thing to exactly. expect of parents, right? Um, and even those don't count as a visitation a, yeah. for this policy or the ARs because that that's more of like a, a program and event. Mm -hmm that parents are encouraged to avail themselves of. But th this to me struck me more as an opportunity for a parent or guardian or their designated professional liaison, right? To come in and make an observation on how well their student is navigating and performing in a classroom. 
Mm -hmm. It's more like an observation for kind of an assessment rather than coming to do the classroom celebrations right. and right. showcases and performances. That, that, that was helpful. Um, we can we can add that distinction um, early on. I guess some other comments I had were <clears throat> in the first paragraph, persons wishing to visit a school should make arrangements in advance with the building. Um, can should we couch this as a request? Should make a request in advance because, again, I think there are some times when it's appropriate to have a visitor. And I can I'm just I mean PSSA has just happened, so I'm just thinking about it. But like we don't want visitors on a PSSA day, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know make a request, and then maybe we can have something like the the building principal will you know do their best to accommodate such request or you know find a different time or something like that. But um, you know just making it just because you pick a day that works for you doesn't necessarily mean that works for the building and that doesn't work for the students. Um, and then something similar in paragraph five. Um, permission of the building principal or their designee shall be required before a visitor may make an unannounced visit to a classroom, school facility, or school grounds to confer with a student or teacher in school during our school hours. Do we need to allow unannounced visits to the classroom or school facilities? I was going to ask if that could be like just get rid of the number five yeah because it doesn't seem necessary because even if it's even if it's I need to talk with my student about something today that still could be a request I don't know why that wouldn't fall under number one um because again it's an unannounced visit and if, it, if it's your child you can always take them out of school mm -hmm. right and take them out of school and talk to them and bring them back um but this just makes it this makes it seem really broad Like you can just make an unannounced visit and, and go and visit the classroom when again there are certain days where that's just not going to be possible and so if, if we need to keep an unannounced visit then i think that we need to add something that says you know the the request will, will you know the building principal will do their best to accommodate the request but at certain inappropriate times it cannot be accommodated or something like that this is um 100 a carryover from okay i think so, do we say 19 2010 1999 yeah so <laughs> okay so i think that we should just strike it then yeah. because i think that any request to um visit the classroom can be in number one so just thinking about this for a moment if there is um an emergency child welfare and safety visit that needs to happen those can sometimes be unannounced and so i wouldn't want our principals to be in the position where they are being viewed as stopping an investigator from speaking to a child if it so happens to be during PSSA if someone is coming in to investigate allegations of abuse and so I want to be careful that we are also not putting our teachers and staff and principals in a place where they're potentially um, prohibiting another office from completing what's necessary. But couldn't that just be a separate for that specific entity? Because I feel like that's the one entity where the unannounced visit is legally an obligation, mm -hmm. whereas like leaving, getting rid of the unannounced section and then having something that specifically just mentions that particular entity. Okay. Or even just having a, you know, unless legally required was, yeah legally. right and yeah. so you know we could have that added to number one um you know and the building will make all will make accommodations for a visit if legally required yeah Is there any more feedback from the committee? I just had two points under the professional observations. There's a number seven. It talks about um, where and when um, the visit can occur or com questions or comments about a visit before or after the visit and outside the presence of children or working staff members. Mm -hmm. And I was just I didn't know what working staff members meant there. Like, is is like you have to kind of go staff, off the private staff members in in the building. Yeah. So it's like you go off to a 
-hmm. private location to have that conversation. Okay. And then it says visitors may not use audio or video recording devices. Is mm -hmm. there some enforcement? Like, do we ask people to leave their phones or is that like just gives the teacher, for example, the chance to say, I'm, I'm sorry, you need to put your phone away. Like that, that gives them that backing to do so. Yes. And put somebody on notice that that's the policy that it isn't recording. Well, yes. Uh, I, I also had a comment under parent and guardian visitations, paragraph three, um, that they, there's authority to ask visitor to leave if they disrupt the classroom or educational program or they violate board policy. Um, I also think that this, the last sentence, failure to leave when asked or repeated documented disruptions may result in loss of classroom visitation privileges. And I wonder whether we should also put referral to appropriate law enforcement authorities because if someone is continually coming to the school property, um, you know, and saying I'm a visitor, I'm allowed to be here disrupting the classroom, um, I think that we would potentially need to call the police for that. Can I ask clarification around um, the military personnel? You mentioned that that was in the school, the state school code. Yes. And so that's why it was added in. Um, so for me, when I'm looking at it, I, I'm confused in the sense of just that it still to me just applies all under guideline number one. So is the reason why that we need to identify military personnel is just that they are allowed to be in their uniform? Yes. So could we, in the sense of then the first part where it says compliance with board policy and district procedures, do we just like refer back to guideline one or does, is that an automatic understanding? Um, we could. I mean, I just, cause I, it, it's not like they're getting special permission. It's just following guideline one and then they're allowed to be in their uniform. Right, right. No, we absolutely could write it that way. It, it almost is written even broader than the rest of the policy that's, that's, as well, which yeah. doesn't really make sense. Because it sounds like they can just do an unannounced visit. And right. so I was like, they still need to follow the same rules as everybody else up in guideline one. We're just okay with them being in their uniforms. Right. That, that's essentially what it says. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I agree with that. Right. It does make it seem like their visit and meeting might be of a different kind. Mm -hmm. And so to avoid that connotation. Are there any more comments or questions? Nope. Okay, so we will we'll keep going. I um I will note the time is eight thirty five. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is a committee that meets every other month, so we um we did kind of allow that we would go for two hours. Um, I think we've been making great progress, so oh, we will gosh. keep at it for a little bit longer. But just did want to let everybody know that. I'm keeping an eye on the coming of nine o'clock. <laughs> Everybody focus. We got it. <laughs> so 908 is um, relations with parents and guardians. And um, as far as the, the district's current version of the policy, we, we didn't have many um, recommended changes. This is again, and you'll notice the theme with some of the newer ones that we're addressing tonight. Um, not a lot of uh, school code or legal requirements. Uh, we did also um, add some language for the committee's consideration. Again, this is just for you to consider from the PSBA's model, um, which was recently revised. And, that, and there's a set of, at least the way that PSBA is now presenting it, there's guidelines. Um, Two, two, two distinct sets, uh, one with five bullets and another with four, or I'm sorry, another with six. And like I said, that overall, there's not much that we had um, that we recommended be revised as far as the substance of the policy. I have a question about number three under promoting and understanding. Yes. So is number three 
almost like an attempt to um, provide an inclusive learning space. Is that what the goal is there? Okay. Yes. Where are you? Oh, okay. And the policy don't be I almost wish that we would actually just say that. Somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would. It's, I kept like grasping for it, trying to see mm -hmm. what are we really saying here. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the use of home was an interesting word. Sometimes, you know, even relationships with the home, when obviously we need the, the people that reside with the child, right? Like, um, it, it had a connotation that yep. was broader and mm -hmm. maybe not um, sensitive to everybody's arrangements. So mm -hmm. wanted to know if there was a different word for I almost feel like if we're saying helping to increase the student's confidence um, in their self and her household, you know, really instead of avoiding the dispersing remarks which might undermine that confidence, mm -hmm. you know, encouraging some sort of inclusion mm -hmm. or, you know, something that is more having a positive spin. Mm -hmm. it's Agreed. To me very negatively. And yes. so we could just yeah. reword that second part and say what we actually are going to do versus what we're trying not to do. Yep. Right. I think like inclusion, a feeling of belonging, mm -hmm. um, you know, these are what we hold out to be our district goals. And so we should incorporate them here. I like that. Yeah, I think in home and visitations and consultations has better understanding of individual children and their problems. I get like in their circumstances in and, their and, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, like there's an, a better way of framing that um, so it doesn't burden the child with right. it. Yeah, I think in general, I want the language to be about what the behavior we're seeking instead of calling out the behavior we don't want. So like, just this is the expectations that we have. And I just had a minor comment that we sometimes say parents slash guardian, and sometimes we say parents and guardians, and sometimes we say parents and legal guardians. I think always just parents slash guardians, mm -hmm. and then that just clears it all up all the way around. Yep, and even in the title and it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just there. anywhere, just parent yep. slash guardian. Mm -hmm. And then it's just cleaned up everywhere. So it was just a minor comment. I would start to with the purpose. I, again, I think it's probably implied, but um, the board believes that the education of children is a joint responsibility, one it shares with parents and guardians or parents slash guardians of students in our schools, not just guardians of the school community, yeah. right? Like, oh, again, yeah. students so in the district. Weird. Yeah. Yep. Um, under home visitations and consultation section, it says, you know, the goal is to secure the maximum cooperation from parents or guardians. Again, I think that's a bar that's just too high. Yeah. And I would, um, under the parent-teacher organization, I'm thinking back this being dated in 1999, I think <laughs> we are more clear now to consider those as a third party mm -hmm. entity, one with which the schools have shared you know, mutual interests and support and, and all of that. But um, I feel like it probably is prudent to clarify that they are a separate mm -hmm. entity from our schools and, and treat it like that. So do you want to revise this section? I mean, should we tighten it up and take some of this out on parent-teacher organizations? Because it's kind of like, why are we, as the board, why do we have all of this about parent-teacher organizations when, I mean, I think we can encourage them and we encourage participation among staff who, you know, uh -huh. would like to participate in their events and their organization. And then also, you know, I, I think we do keep in assist the organization to secure our new school buildings. But um and it is uh, yeah, I don't know, Dr. Rishi, how how we've navigated that since that distinction came into place back when my kids were in elementary school. But it was um, you know, I think it is a useful venue for communication, right? The the principals use that, the 
you know, the school teachers participate in those and, and have that open line of communication. It's a great way for the parents and guardians to be involved in the school and can contribute to the school culture and climate and resources. Like, I think there are a lot of benefits, but it is, it is a separate thing. I, in, in response to your question, I can tell you that my experience with the building PTOs, they handle acquisition of the building space for their meetings, like the, the leaders do. Mm -hmm. It's not something that the building principal schedules. Um, you could just have the first paragraph mm -hmm. there, you know, yeah. about what they are, and as soon as it says, like, not attempt to dominate and, and direct them, um, we could put, you know, collaborate with or so, you know something mm -hmm. again, to be more positive and I'd end it there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I do think though that we need a statement saying that parent teacher organizations are yeah. not run by the district. By the district. I mean they're mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. they are separate from yep. the district mm -hmm. because I think that can be confusing for folks who first come mm -hmm. into the district, mm -hmm. right? And then you do get a lot of communication from the PTO. Yep. Um but not sent home in backpacks. To go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it comes in my email, Bridget. It's 2022. Uh, yeah. When I was when I had kids in elementary school, that was a shocker. <laughs> what do you mean we're not getting them in the Friday packets? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I agree with that. Just keeping it to be the first paragraph. Yeah. Um, but then also with a clarify with a clarifying statement that these are separate organizations from the district and the district does not sponsor PTOs. We encourage them. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. With the guidelines that are at the bottom, are we wanting to discuss that as well? Yeah, I would have yeah. some um, So I'm just curious when it says um, parent-teacher conferences to permit two-way communication between home and school, is the parent-teacher conferences that it's implying here the more formal parent-teacher conferences, or is this also implying that parents can request a conference with a teacher, if that makes sense? I, I read it as the more formal parent-teacher yeah. conferences. Okay. Just my experience is those are not very long where I would feel comfortable disclosing information about my home life with like, and there's other parents. Other, do you know what I mean? Like yeah, that for me. A different descriptor. Yeah. Identifier for it. Yeah. Okay. For me, this. Communication. I mean, communication. I, I, I don't know what I'm looking for. It's just more my own experience with parent teacher conferences are not a time when I would have disclosed information of personal things that were happening in the home that I thought the teacher might need. I'd want to have a private conversation with the teacher at a different time. So if we're, if we're just holding like conferences, yeah, you've got a different word for that. I guess, or, yeah. Or an additional one. There are the conferences and opportunities to meet individually as needed or something like that. Right. I guess my question is, do we want these at all? Because yeah. I don't see that they add that yeah. much and it kind of just seems, um, like the board is putting itself into the um, mm -hmm. administration's business, I I don't think that the, I don't think that the policy as it's written needs an administrative regulation, because I mean this is really just um, promoting understanding between the the board and parents and guardians, and I I just don't. It doesn't seem like we need to have very specific um, guidelines for for how this is implemented. Um, yeah, I'm fine with that. Just Me not, just not had, including it. I yep. had questions about how how didactic we needed to be about what parents are doing. <laughs> yeah, right. So yeah, this feels more an administrative level decision making, and I think that that's fine for us to not have it in this policy. Right, and it's just something that I I just think it's covered in other places that we don't need to have this these rigid ARs here. I think the like the principals, especially thinking back at elementary school, do a good job of communicating the ways that parents and guardians can support the success of their kids and modeling that and having opportunities to do that. Like that doesn't need the board to be directing it. Right. I think that's a good point too. Is that maybe what works for one building doesn't work for another building, and to try and have a a, a district policy on very specific like mm -hmm. conferences, for example, you need to have this conference. It needs to go this way. Well, maybe that doesn't work for everyone. It may be different elementary school and middle school and high school. And, um, you know, even with like the middle school having like the student led conferences and things, you know, that I'm not sure that would work in first grade. And so, you know, we don't want to have to go through that minutia um, of really micromanaging 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions from the committee? Mm-hmm. That brings us to 909 municipal government relations. And there, there were um, some recommended revisions, particularly within the, the authority section. Um, a lot of this does come from school code and, and descriptions of the, the relationships between school districts and um, municipalities and, and delegation of responsibilities and, and things like that. So, um, but other than that, authority section um, and then a little bit under delegation of responsibility there's there's not much else that was recommended i had a couple of comments one like there's places that refer to like a borough council which isn't a local governance kind of entity so cleaning some of that up um the police department section um says is the police department is granted the full right and authority to enter in the same manner and with the same force and effect that they would enter any property owned by the township of Haverford is, is that the practice? I was just curious, like, um, I, I'm just not sure, you know, what kind of protocols or, or ways that like, does the police just enter the building as if it's their own (laughs) township building or did they, kind of ask and and arrange for a couple of years now the police have been coming through and but they always stop in the office Mm -hmm. you know when they go in and that was something that we mutually came to the the agreement upon that they would do that as a means to be more be like a a way for the children to see them and and not feel something's wrong every time they see a a police officer particularly the you know the younger children growing up with that experience Uh, so they're coming into the building but as i said they check in at the office when they arrive like they come in through the main entrance they're you know they're not coming in back doors (laughs) right i just even the way that this is worded Mm -hmm. like i'm Mm -hmm. picturing Mm -hmm. like you know the Mm -hmm. at the township building where the police may have their headquarters right they're using conference rooms they're using the coffee room like that kind of (laughs) stuff i'm like do they just come in and be like this is the same as my building i'm gonna take over this conference room like i it just Mm -hmm. seems like it's brought and then there are um things like the decisions to maybe do a search or to you know whatever else might fall under a police activity but that it's like they don't just come in with their own like mm-hmm. same force and effect as if they've decided that on their own right they do not I'm, I'm wondering if we can add something in here about notification and coordination mm-hmm. with the district because it sounds like that's what they're already the doing mm-hmm. and so if and it certainly seems reasonable to ask that you know we're not necessarily saying it has to be a request but it, it you know notification and coordination with the district for these visits I had a similar um, question or, you know, comment um, on the second paragraph. It's the policy of the board to cooperate in every possible manner with local, regional, and federal officials and agencies, bearing in mind the obligation of the district to its citizens and to its schools and school personnel to the students. Instead of possible there, I would like to replace it with reasonable. Um, I don't know what possible means. Every possible manner. Again, that really feels like no stone unturned, you know. Um, and um, I think I think saying reasonable is something that people can understand and um, would would have the same effect. I like that. So we're saying the authority paragraphs here are school code paragraphs. Yes. Okay. we may authorize um, tickets on vehicles parked illegally on school. <laughs> like to get, that's a, the board may authorize that every, like have we ever been asked to do that? <laughs> Start ticketing people. Or I'm kind of surprised, like why isn't that all just always allowed if vehicles are parked illegally that they have to ask us or we have to decide to 
cars ticketed. Like right. what these policies contain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the uh, in the police department section again, um, why is it personnel? Like why would personnel of the police department need to be in school district built I don't understand beyond that. officers you mean? beyond yeah because I think personnel, I, don't like know the officers. I, I don't know enough about the yeah. language that's used you know delineating okay. roles and responsibilities but there are officers but then there are others who we refer to as detective oh okay um, okay and that makes sense okay because so i'm just I like you know some administrative difference. assistant or something yeah. is like i'm coming into the building like i just didn't understand okay well and also i mean i don't know if it's happening yet in our township but thinking for future mm -hmm. there are quite a few police departments that are now um hiring social workers and other yeah, mental health sense. counselors and so that that, that broad sense. term could then also include them because I'm just thinking through like full right and authority to enter upon any and all lands operated by the board. I'm like, why would just some personnel? But that I guess that makes more sense. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> this language needs to be like modernized. Yeah, yeah. Too. Like yeah I think like district property is yeah. fair. Any and all lands. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, it's just well, a really strange makes it sound like it's possible we have others that we've lost track of any and all <laughs> I'm thinking like, I was thinking much more fantastical like all of our lands different lands um <laughs> yeah um then separately I, I think the, my same comment as before on park and recreation board um I would change possible to reasonable again whenever reasonable and not in conflict with the needs of the school programs the district will cooperate with township for the use of recreational facilities. What's a play field? <laughs> play field. Playing field? Like I don't know. Field. Yeah. Like field. Just a, field. Okay. Is that a term do we, do we call things play fields? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. We, again, just like a modernization of yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, I can. I think we just say fields, yeah. <laughs> right? I, or mm -hmm. property, district property. Playgrounds. Athletic fields. Athletic fields. <laughs> yeah. Playgrounds, fields, and gymnasiums, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because sometimes they have playground camp. Mm -hmm. Sure, and I don't know if that's at the district or not, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess. I don't know. Do we, if we do ever do auditoriums or other spaces, and doesn't have to be just for recreation, right? Like parks program could use. Could use classrooms or the cafeteria or things like that if they were running a program. Yeah, you could see mm -hmm. use of an auditorium or something. You know. Just, just facilities. Facil yeah, so facilities. Like we should out. just just take the use of of district facilities, right? Mm -hmm. That covers everything. And just also just a making language simpler or more simple. <laughs> um, <laughs> in the police department one, where it says like, I know we already talked about this, but I just was thinking it's really wordy that in the same manner and with the same force and effect. Mm -hmm. Can't it just be in the same manner? Like, Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just we'll have less words. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As the said police force could do, like it, it is really wordy, you're right? Yeah, just in the same manner feels like it says all that needs to be said. Absolutely. And, and just so the committee's aware, we're, with sections like this that are, are kind of more specific and unique to the district, we are trying to leave some of this in so mm -hmm. <laughs> you have the opportunity to make fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> Something to the original chew on, version. Yeah. Okay. He was paying attention. Okay. All right. So I am going to call it. We okay. got through all but one. Great. Um, which is great job. Well done. Um, I appreciate the preparation and the contributions everybody on the committee made, bringing the different um, professional expertise and experiences to weigh in. I think this is um, tough work because, you know, you we necessarily are put in the position of thinking of worst case scenarios and imagining that, right? And that's not always a pleasant space to be, but um, I think we have given good thought and consideration and improvements to the policies that are coming before us. And um, we've made a good dent in the audit mm -hmm. schedules. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment. If anyone in the audience has remarks tonight, one, okay. 
Uh, state your name, confirm your residency in the township, and you will have three minutes to address the committee. Hi, my name is Helene Comrie Smith. I live here in Haverford Township. Um, it's my understanding um, it's the responsibility of the school board directors to provide some level of details um, when possible when you're providing documentation that's part of an agenda. Um, some of the policies that were drafted, including 919, which was never drafted, was not provided to the public. And Weisler Perlstein, you should be directing the school's directors to provide them to the public. Um, as for policies, too, I just want to say they should be read aloud so that at the meeting, so people on the outside understand what is happening. Um, in the past, there's precedence as prior boards read them uh, policies allowed in their first and second readings, as well as our human, our former human resource director, Greg Parker, also read them as well. You discussed tonight reviewing communication, um, and it was a policy, and it was like number four. And I just want to say that um, we need to be addressing what is occurring in our schools. When we talk about what is occurring and what is public information, I think when you talk about rumors, when we give more specifics to parents and kind of address the community, it happens to quelch a lot of the rumors. Other school districts in Pennsylvania are providing transparency, and some of you that are now on the board kind of said that they were going to talk about transparency and be more transparent. So what we need is like, what is occurring? What kind of threat? Was it a bomb threat? Was it someone's going to bring a, a weapon to school? That really kind of helps parents feel a little more comfortable and confident on what's happening. So some things are veiled threats and some things are, are true. And it's up to the parent to make the decision whether they feel comfortable or not to send their child to school. Um, you know, I think, you know, even to like with the staff that had been removed, like what is it we're talking about? What happens? Like you don't have to give details and it doesn't have to be vague, but just give the parents the common courtesy and fu and parents who were who are now no longer parents of the district, but former parents of the district, that information so that they feel comfortable knowing like what kind of questions should I be asking my child, even though they're an adult now? Um, for example, that the incident that occurred in the, you know, in the high school, you know, that caused a lot of the rumors and speculation that occurred in this township. I also want to talk about um, policy 907. When you talk about two visits per year, I was a parent and I am a parent of a child um, with an IEP. You know, we do want parents to come in and visit a classroom because I need to determine what's appropriate for my child because the district might tell me what's appropriate. But as an educator, I kind of know what's appropriate and not appropriate for my own children. And some parents might need also to hire a consultant to come in a few times to evaluate the current program their child is in. So when we talk about limiting people coming in, you know, I really would ask you to really broaden some of that because I sat here and listened to you tonight go back and forth, but what about the kids with special needs and those parents? Because those parents have a right to make some determination for their children. Um, you know, that's really concerning. And, um, you know, tomorrow, as you went over at 907, I have to say, I have to call you out on the hypocrisy. Tomorrow, hundreds of people are coming into our school buildings to vote. I mean, I have to say parents are like feeling slapped in the face by this. And we're sitting here having this discussion about who's coming in our building. And our buildings are kind of unsafe tomorrow. I understand you have policies and procedures through, throughout and the police are coming. But you know what? Like, I think that forethought needs to occur when we're bringing all these strangers into the building. And I'm just asking you to be a little more mindful. So that's really all I have to say tonight. Thank you. Um, one of those thank you for your comments we can take those into consideration the one um, comment that we can make tonight is uh, about why these work papers and drafts aren't available on the agenda um, and dr. Rishi would you be able or I'm sure for this first for this first meeting these are it's a working meeting uh, when we do bring them forward to the board starting with first reading we have been putting it on the agenda for public access 
it's never voted when it's brought forward for first reading. Then there's a second reading. So the public does have access and opportunity to get, to give comment. Thank you. Any comments from the committee? All right, well, thank you everyone. The meeting is adjourned.